TV specials and things like that, and you may have seen one called the Silver Pharaoh. Because at that time, silver was more rare in Egypt than gold was, and it's much more difficult to work with because it's a harder metal. And they found a tomb, and it was in the same place where the Shishon ruled out of. It was northern delta portion of Egypt. They found this tomb there, and it had the silver sarcophagus in it which was really unusual. King Cups was gold, you know. And we think gold is the most valuable thing. And here was this solid silver sarcophagus, sarcophagus and that was Sunni's one, the guy who had been just before this other guy took over. But he kind of brought in this influence from Libya. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Like Libya is shaking things up in that part of the world. So we're way down here in the delta, that's what we're talking about off of that map. Uh, Sunni's one passes away and his military commander looks like from what they are showing through some rather careful planning has become the next God's representative on earth down there representing us. They believe the Pharaoh of course was the sun god that he is an embodiment of the sun god. So this guy came up to the military. He managed to marry his family into the Pharaoh's family and just did all kinds of interesting things to get himself in place. The question is, why did he decide to go up here and, and invade this country? Because he had befriended the competition here. We're looking at Rehoboam. You know, Jeroboam spent time in Egypt and then came back out of Egypt it appears that Jeroboam, remember his personality as we looked at him? Does anybody remember what kind of a guy he was? What kind of a leader was Jeroboam? He was weak. He was just willing to let other people tell him. He, he didn't listen to his father. Okay, that was Rehoboam. Jeroboam. Oh, oh Jeroboam. 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 Isn't that confusing, right? Yeah. <laughs> names are too much alike. Jeroboam was a guy who came from Egypt and... He's a careful planner. Careful yeah, he came up, oh, it's not me, it's what the people want. He was also very arrogant. Very arrogant, and remember, one of his big concerns was, I'm going to control people. And how did he control people and make sure he didn't lose them back to Rehoboam, the, the wimpy guy in Jerusalem? Set it up. Yeah. Set it up. Yeah, we'll get our idols, we'll get our worship system, we'll just make a... A curtain, if you will, across right here. People do not have to cross this borderline here. We'll keep them up there. He did everything he possibly could to control everything. He also misnamed whoever wanted to be a priest. Messed with the priesthood. Yeah, he threw out the Levites, anybody that could bring an offering or buy a position, if you will. You could buy yourself a priesthood. You can buy yourself a position in the religious system. You look at that personality, and it appears that there may be evidence that he also decided he didn't need each of them. When he went up there, he probably went up there with support from Egypt, probably tried to have some connections. And I was wondering, did he actually instill, encourage Egypt to go after Rehoboam? And he very well could have, because one of the things that Shishon needed was financing. They were having a little trouble back home, but other parts of the world were quite weak, especially Assyria and Babylon hadn't got their feet under them at that time. So we got some weakness over there, but there were rumors about right here in Jerusalem, there was a temple, and there was a palace, and there was gold made silver as common as dirt at the end of Solomon's reign. Nobody cared about silver there. May have been down in Egypt. Remember Sunni's silver sarcophagus. Silver's precious down there. Up here, silver is common. <coughs> you suppose those rumors leak down to Egypt. You have to wonder. What would, what would a uh, pharaoh need out of here? So it looks like a combination of maybe Jeroboam telling 
the pharaoh, ah, I don't need you anymore. I'm going to do my own thing up here. And a combination of Jerusalem holding incredible wealth that lured him out. And it tells us in, I think we looked last time, that the troops that he gathered up, it says in chapter 12 of Second Chronicles, that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, because they've been unfaithful to the Lord, the real reason why all this should take place, that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem with 1,200 chariots, 60,000 horsemen, and the people who came with him that are unnumbered, because it says, uh, were without number. In other words, it wasn't that they didn't have any. It was that there were so many, it wasn't worth trying to count. I mean, it was a massive army that he brings. And they brought the, the Lubim, the Sukim, and the Ethiopians. And there's different ideas about who those folks were. Some think that they were others from the area, some were some desert uh, dwellers that they may have picked up from the east. Some other places that they had control or alliances with had come in and they brought this massive army and they're headed north up into this area. The reason I think both of them might have been involved is because when I remember the, do you still have the slide of all the cartouches on the wall and, and in the temple? And, there we go. That's a little hard to see. And if you go online and, and you uh, and you Google search Shishan One, you will find uh, more detailed pictures that the guy has, but but you have to buy big versions of it so you can't see them this way. But each of these. Uh, Cartouches, there's some really interesting things, and they represent towns in Israel that he conquered. And the reason I think that a lot of them might be because he was dealing with Jeroboam is if you'll pop back to the map, or a map at least, a mining map, just in there we go. A whole bunch of them right up here. And why would you go up and invade and conquer cities in the guy you're buddies with? Unless you have a rebellion or some kind of a disagreement on your hands. More cities were taken up north up here. They were in Beth-Shan. They were through this valley here. They have records of them through this valley, through the one here, all that area got hit really hard. And in fact, some of the artifacts that they have since found that verify it are things in some of these towns. There's a couple places where they actually found uh, a stell. They would leave a little thing saying, remember I was here? And it's got his name on it. Megiddo is one of them. So, so there's, he was way up in Israel, and yet he came, took a, was here a little bit, but he, there is no cartouche saying that he took Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? Why wouldn't there be a cartouche that says, I would, you know, they lied and bragged about everything. Because they removed they it. They had a deal. They never took the city, but what it tells us is, he says he captured the fortified cities of Judah and came as far as Jerusalem. So he took some of their fortified cities, came up to Jerusalem, and then we had Shemaiah the prophet came to Rehoboam and said, you know what, that guy's knocking on your door. There's a reason for this to happen. There's a reason that that guy came charging up this way and came and got all these places down here and worked his way up to and actually came around and came in from the north. Jerusalem. I am on chapter 12 of 2 Chronicles so far. Oh, Still, okay. Hang in there with me. Or the other would be if you want your thumb in 1 Kings 14. All right. Is the other one. But he cleans out after it tells us in Chronicles that the king humbled himself and said must have really woke up a little bit at least. It says he humbled himself and uh, and this is where is it here? Eyeballs to focus here. 
Verse 7, when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, well, first 6 says, the prince of Israel he humbled himself and said, the Lord is righteous. In other words, he's right. That's what we've done. And the Lord saw that, and the word came to Shammai saying, here's what I'm going to tell them. Because they've humbled themselves, I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some measure of deliverance. My wrath shall not be poured out on Jerusalem by means of Shishak, but they will become his slaves or servants, so that they may learn the difference between my service and the service of the kingdoms of the countries. Says, I want you to understand, when you go out there and start cutting deals with these countries, and you think you're going to build your empire by cutting deals and doing marriage things and all the stuff that you're doing and that's common there, you're going to find out what it's like to serve one of the kings. I want you to know the difference between my service and the world and you're going to get to taste it right here. And so here's what happened. Uh, he came up against Jerusalem. <coughs> Verse 9, and he took the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's palace. And he cleaned them out. He took everything. And he even took the golden shields which Solomon had made. And then we talked last time about the big deal over the shields. That's an indication of the king's heart and some other issues that are going on there. But think about how much that was. One commentator I read estimates the amount of the material he could have taken out of this city right here not only paid for that campaign, but probably would pay for running his country for a long, long time. He just made the mother load haul out of there. Why would there not be a cartouche? You have to wonder. It's because he didn't seize the city, but he took a whole boatload of material home in payoff to get him to go somewhere else. And then, as you may recall, we talked about the fact that things started falling apart back home. They believe there's some evidence that there was some rebellion in the ranks back home that he had to go back and deal with. And that was basically the end of him. He died shortly after that. They think that he may have died right around within a year or so of uh, this event. So his reign ends and gets passed on, and they have some sons follow up behind him, but that just kind of took him out at, after that point. But they took a huge haul of gold and silver. And if you will remember, any any Raiders of the Lost Ark fans in here, the movie? Do you remember from the movie what they were looking for? Do you remember why they were looking for it in Egypt? They were looking for the Ark of the Covenant because there still is out there of theory, a speculation on did they take the golden Ark of the Covenant out of the temple and take it with them? Some people say no, there's evidence that it was still there and the worship continued and there was no thing about, oh my gosh, we lost it. We all know it's in the archives there in Washington, D.C., right? Buried in the basement. There is, that's the thing. I forgot about that movie. It's buried underneath Washington, D.C. How could I not remember that? Or is it Mount Rushmore it's under? I don't know. Anyway. It seems to me that they would have wanted that. So that's one of the things that they would have been looking for to take. I mean, why go take a shield when you can have the Ark of the Covenant? If you could have had the Ark of the Covenant in the temple of Amun-Ra mm -hmm. in Egypt, would you have done it? Mm -hmm. Oh, you bet. And there would have been, the way they brag about stuff, there would have been cartouches all over about their great victory. Yes, but remember what happened when somebody... <laughs> That's what this is about to say. They, 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 they found out that you better not do it. Yeah, you wonder. They just probably found out how hard Maybe they found out how many dead soldiers were laying there in front of the yeah. ark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the cherubim that was over the ark, the wings that put out and touched the walls. So yeah. Lots and lots and lots of gold. A lot of gold in that gold-plated building inside. They didn't worship God. <laughs> Could have been. They knew about and the other thing is God said, I won't let him completely destroy it. I won't let that happen. 
And so it appears that he was hands off the temple. They took the stores, took the gold, you know, the stuff in the storerooms and that sort of thing. But it appears the temple itself was hands off. All that bronze that was in that great sea was left. And how do we know that? Because you read. Guess who got that? Babylon, Babylon got Nebuchadnezzar got all of that stuff. He cleaned that stuff out and took it back until Nehemiah brings some of it back. Obviously not the sea. It got broken up and melted down and turned into something else. But so you can kind of follow this track through and really God said, well, you go this far and that's it. But he still took a huge haul out of there. So we're kind of, we got through some of the history and you can see what happened. Took a big chunk out of Israel. He, they took quite a beating as well. So we've got a nation now that's really uh, reeling. It's greatly weakened. They're split in the two. And uh, they've had their first shot across the bow. And remember, you got to go back. Every time one of these things happen, remember, you got to go back and pull out your notes. And somewhere back here, you got scribbles just like that, right? And it says, the general prayer here in forgive. And that's the prayer, the dedication prayer of Solomon. And it's amazing to me how everything that I read about that happens to these kings all the way through, and you read what happens, and it's in Solomon's own words, reminding the nation of what's in Deuteronomy, that Moses said to them, what's going to happen when you do this? And it says, when you are defeated by an enemy due to sin, you should turn and remember that that's why you're defeated. It's because you're sin. You should turn back to God. Turn to this place. And when you pray to this place, you know, God will restore you. <coughs> and you think that, well, Rehoboam got some of that. But obviously God's looking at him and saying, well, you repented, but... He's still hanging out there thinking he's maybe he put a letter out to Assyria. We will see the kings of Judah in order to beat the king of Israel is going to put out an all points bulletin to Assyria saying, hey, y'all want to come down here and help. So we didn't all learn a lesson and I suspect he saw in Rehoboam this tendency to figure it out himself. Why would I think that? What you see last time that we talked about, we hinted at it here, that says Rehoboam's the kind of guy that's going to play a little cover-up. He's going to not quite admit things are as bad as they are. The shields. That is just such an interesting little footnote to me. So he came and he takes those and mentions these golden shields with a big deal. They lined this hall, whatever this... The, palace of the forest of Lebanon. Probably was a pillar with these cedar columns or something. A beautiful place lined with these gold shields that was the gold we took in battle when we defeated that enemy and we took all their gold we had it made into shields and it's like, nah, we're somebody. And they took it. And Rehoboam's answer to that isn't to go, hmm, We've been defeated by an enemy. What do we do now? We need to get back to God. Instead, he goes out and he dials up his latest contact on uh, shieldsrs.com. <laughs> says, hey, I need some shields and I want them to look just like this. But I'm kind of on a tight budget. Because I had a big land payment that I had to make. And she shonk took all my ready cash, so I really need kind of a budget version, but I wanted to look just like this. And that's what we see. He made shields of bronze in verse 10 in their place. So we replaced them. That's what I'm saying. They look just like, except we said brass is nice and shiny, looks from a distance just like gold. Polish it up. Polish it up really good. And he committed them to the care of the commanders of the guard who guard the door of the king's house. So the commanders, the guard that when he comes and goes, the security patrol. And it happened as often as the king entered the house of the Lord. So when he goes through from his palace over to the temple, 
the guards came and carried them and brought them back to the guards' room. So they pack them out. You can see them all shiny. See those guys packing those shields, and the king does his little profession, procession out, and everybody can be impressed by them shining in the sun. And when they get done, they hang them back in the palace so everyone can admire them and see our great victory and the gold that they're made of, right? They stuck them back in the armory. Why? Because they're afraid somebody's going to steal them? They're bronze. Yeah, a little value there. Mm, we don't want anybody looking close at those shields. Any foreign dignitaries or anything come by? I thought those were gold. You know, those don't look like gold when you get up close to them. It doesn't say that, but you've got to wonder why did they stick them back in the guard room. Wow. But then it says, but when he humbled himself, in verse 12, the anger of the Lord turned away from him so as not to destroy him completely, and also conditions were good in Judah. Hmm. Why, isn't that an odd footnote? Conditions are good in Judah. What do you mean conditions are good in Judah? They just lost all their gold. All their silver. They can still eat. Oh, so maybe there were some good in Israel. So there probably were some people who still followed the Lord. Maybe the king did not. So it could be some good. There was things were not terrible. And one of the things that kept it from being cleared down the tubes quite yet was they had a lot of imports into our new residents that came into the land. So where it's when it says that when he humbled himself, does that mean that he realized what he'd done and the deceit of his country and so he went to the Lord and humbled himself for that and repented? Or what, I think what exactly that, did he do? Yeah. <laughs> okay. The problem that they were facing and the thing that happened with Rehoboam, it kind of goes back a couple of weeks, but if you all remember, Rehoboam came in and he started with his stupid move that lost half the kingdom. But then when he came back in, one of the things that happened when Jeroboam starts building his invisible wall between them is that all the Levites are now out of a job. They're not out of a job. They're out of favor. They are in a bad place. So anybody that's a Levite that can't buy off of Jeroboam's deal packs up and they move right back here. They got no choice. They all come into Judah. If you are a Jew who is faithful to the Lord, who wants to worship at the temple, and wants to follow through with the feasts and things as they're commanded, you better get out of Israel. Because these guys up here are not going to look favorably on that. You're going to be ostracized, you're going to be persecuted, and they all packed up and they moved to Judah. So Judah got a huge influx of faithful teachers, religious leaders, and people that moved back to here from all the rest of Israel. So they had this big influx of folks. And for a while, that kind of held them together. And by the fifth year of his reign, that started to fall apart. And what you find out is all of a sudden, we're starting to see these things spring up on every little high hill. Let's see if it tells us in Kings, I think it is. Let me find it here. Uh, there it is. Verse 22. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy more than all their fathers had done with the sins which they had committed. Boy, that's the big statement. That's going all the way back. All their fathers. For they also built for themselves high places and sacred pillars, and Asherim on every high hill and beneath every luxuriant tree. And there were also male cult prostitutes in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations, which the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. And you go, how disappointing. Here is the nation that should have been right. Let me, I want to show you, since we're here, and we're almost out of time, we go. I know I'm wearing your Bible out. Stick your marker back in Kings, turn back to Chronicles. I want you to look at the very end of that chapter 12 of Chronicles. It's after the conditions were good. In verse 13, So Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned. 
So he was able to kind of build things back. He was 41 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. And then there's this interesting note. The city which the Lord had chosen from all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. Why would that get stuck in there? To me, that's just like this huge contrast. Here is the nation going for all the junk that they supposedly had driven out when, when they all came in. These are the religions of the Canaanites that were there when Joshua blew his trumpet and they charged across the river that day. Well, they came in with the worship in one place and that's where it's present. Yeah, he said, worship in this place. And he actually has done it. He has moved. He says, this is the city right here that I have chosen. I have chosen this place. And I have set my my presence there, the Shekinah glory, at this point is still in the temple, and I think that's probably the other reason why they didn't get off with that ark, is because you wouldn't even get close enough to touch it if you pulled back the curtain and the shining Shekinah glory of God hit you, and you weren't the high priest and the once a year purified and everything else, you got smoked right there. So the presence of God is right there. And he says, in the context of Rehoboam, I have chosen this place. And then the nation, and even people right here on the opposite hill from Jerusalem, Rehoboam had already set it up. In fact, Solomon had it set up, now I think about it. On the other hill, right across the Kidron Valley, on the high place, Solomon had set up in the place of worship, and Milcom, the worship of Milcom. You remember the worship of Milcom is the same as Molech, which is the one where you sacrifice your children in order to get fertility of the land and for all the good things to happen so you can have a productive agricultural society. You need to worship the fertility gods and the storm gods. And, and they set it up right there, and God makes this little note. This is the place had chosen from all the tribes of Israel to put my name there. And he did evil because he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. It just blows you away. He said, I did everything for you. And so I was thinking about that, going, well, that's fascinating. That's interesting. Why do I care? So what? Isn't this a great story? And just history unfolding and battles and people going there. And you see the rise and fall of nations in an incredibly short period of time. And so what's God trying to tell us? Where is this kind of glory, if you will, today? There's no temple in Jerusalem anymore. It's the Dome of the Rock. I think God did that on purpose. There's no temple there. We don't know where the Ark of the Covenant is. You know, the movie ended. <laughs> so we don't know where it is. Where is There's no Ark of the Covenant. You know, some Jewish, very faithful Jewish people are trying to gather up all the bits and pieces because someday they're hoping. And there's a hint that in Revelation and other places that someday that that Jewish worship will be reestablished. And of course, we know that right after that begins to happen, you know, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is going to come take his place. But in the meantime, where's God? He's within us. Not only is just a kind of glory, but this actual spirit dwells within us. Ephesians tells us that's our stamp, our seal, our down payment on the future glory that we will share is the fact that he's put that within us. So it is right there, the place where God has chosen, as it says here, the city, the place which the Lord had chosen from all of Israel, all of the world, to put His name there is where? Right here. And what are we surrounded with? We're surrounded by the enemy. We're surrounded by the enemy. We're surrounded. What does the world worship? 
What's your world worship right now? Success. Money. A good job. Fancy cars. Wheat that doesn't get eaten by fireworks. <laughs> Humongous shields. New combines. New tractors. Press the neighbors. You know what it's all about? You know, you've seen the bumper sticker, the one who has the most toys when he dies wins, right? Do we believe it? Well, no, we're not supposed to believe that. I'm supposed to believe that what's most important is learning what's in this book, is following what God says, being a witness for Him, being a testimony in my life for the kind of character God is, so that the nations out here traveling through the highways and byways of my nation will know who He is and look at my life and say, there's something different. His God is greater than mine. There's something about you that looks different. And what do I do? I get upset with some stupid machine and throw my six-pound hammer across the shop. And you go, you know, and where is the glory of God in that? You know, I, I use that a little facetiously as a, but I mean, isn't that what happens to us? We have within us the resources for everything we need in life between the Word of God that God gives us to put in here and the spirit that he gives us to put in there, everything we need for life and for godliness, he's provided free. It's right here. And my tendency is to do exactly what these guys did. Yeah. Boy, things are tough down on the farm or financially or whatever. What's the first thing I'm going to do? The very first thing I'm going to do is whip out my bookkeeping program and go through and crunch the numbers and call my banker and say, oh my gosh, what can we do? Isn't it? Your tendency is to figure it out. I'm going to figure it out somehow. I'll make a, you know, I can make a deal with Ammon. I'll make a deal with Babylon. Maybe I can make a deal with Egypt. And I can work something out and I'll fix it somehow. And God just says, would you just turn to me and remember that when you are defeated by an enemy, you do this sin or do your own stupidity or whatever it is, that you're supposed to turn to me and remember. And that's a shot over my bow. When something blows up in harvest and everything goes to pieces, it's a shot over my bow to say, what are you depending on? When your pastor comes down with an incurable disease, and he's no longer going to be able to do what he's done for 15 years, and we're so comfortable, and we got the email. We're so comfortable with just and it's easy, he's here, he's taking care of everything. We're dependent on him, or are we dependent on God? Are we trusting our God to take care of us when the rug gets pulled out? He's saying, hmm, well, when this happens, if there's a plague or famine or pestilence or blight or locust or whatever, would you turn to this place and look at me? And then, did you notice that he never says, this might happen? You know, just in case it should happen in your life, every single one of these prayers is, when that happens. And the message to me is, Ron, when you lose your cool and you want to pitch that hammer across the shop, and you see Tabitha standing there going, whoa, what happened to him? <laughs> it's a reminder. Oh, yeah. God's taking care of that problem. Oh, yeah. That's not what it's all about. It's going to be okay. Just turn and remember who you are. And trust Him and not yourself. So I think there's a huge... This whole story is repeat after repeat after repeat. You say, God, how many kings do we have to see go this route before we get the message? And He says, well, more. <laughs> you haven't got it yet. But I mean, it's this whole story of the kings of the New Testament is this yo-yo and up and down. And it all goes back to this prayer, which all goes back to Deuteronomy. And God's just got the same message right on through to the New Testament. It's incredible. We're out of time. Folks are coming in, you know, barns the doors. I do have uh, 
a handout for you. Uh, if you want to get a head start and study it, you can come up, pick one up of the, uh, the, the kingdoms and the kings and relationship to each other and all. So you can start sorting that out. You can come by and grab one up here on your way out or whatever. Uh, you're welcome to have those and we'll begin needing those because it's going to get really confusing as all the guys with the same funny sounding names are taking kingdoms. <laughs> uh, it'll be crazy. So if you want one, come up and get one here. And, uh, let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. We thank you for the amazing archaeological evidence of, of the things we read about here. And as much as we'd like it to be much more complete, we'd like to find every little detail. Uh, you require of us faith uh, that what you're telling us is true and accurate because there are things that we can't have evidence for can't have physical evidence of the heart of God and His love for us. We have to see that in what you tell us and what you've done for us. Uh, we can see that, I guess, uh, in a sense, in your Son, who came and gave His life for us, who was promised even as this uh, temple was built, He was his, a whole picture of who He was and what He would do is there for us, it was there for them. And uh, it was sufficient for them to see and believe that the Savior that would be provided. It's uh, sufficient for us to look back and realize that He has come. And that you loved us enough to give us your very Son to make it possible that we would be able to have within us everything we need for life and for godliness. And uh, not just uh, some kind of stuffy life that we live that somehow is religious, but a life that is full, that is joyful, that is exciting, that is interesting, and filled uh, with the love of God that passes understanding. Help us, Father, to know that, to experience it, to be able to share it with others. And when we find ourselves defeated or plagued or whatever it might be, would it perk our ears up and help us to be like Rehoboam even more so? to turn around and recognize that, yes, you are righteous, you are right, and we are wrong, and would you call us back to yourself and restore us to fellowship with you, that we might give praise and glory to your grace. I thank you, Jesus.